Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to thank you for joining our last episode of PTV Talks, What's New and PTV Vazoom for 2023. I'm going to let um, a couple more people come in, so we'll start the webinar in approximately maybe a minute or so. Thank you. Hello again. So we're going to start our webinar now. I know there's a couple more people coming in, but once again, thank you for joining us today um, for our last episode of PTV Talks, What's New and PTV Vazoom. We have two of our experts, Adam Groves and Cheaton, um, here to discuss what's coming for 2023. Um, I only have one announcement before this, and that is to look out for our 2023 PTV talk schedule. We have fun and exciting new series coming out in 2023, and we would like for you guys to participate. So you'll get an email um, sometime shortly, and you can register for all or register individually. And Adam, we're ready to start. Excellent. Thank you so much, Tiffany, and thank you to everyone on the line for joining us today. Uh, as Tiffany mentioned, my name is Adam Groves, and I'll be doing the presentation today, but I also have Chayton Yoshi on the line to help answer with any questions we may have at the end. Uh, today, we'll be discussing the new features and improvement in PTV Zoom version 2023. So just as a reminder, anyone who has an active maintenance agreement or subscription has access to the latest version. So if you'd like to try out the new version, please feel free to download it and begin exploring. Uh, we'll be sending out a link to that download page and a follow-up email, but you're also going to have access uh, to that just through our regular website. So um, you can go on there and download it. Also, take a look at the What's New document if you want to view some more detailed information about any of these new features. That's available either in the Start page in Zoom or on that download page as well. So for our agenda today, for the purpose of organizing the presentation, I grouped the new features into a couple different kind of buckets. The first is activity-based modeling support, the dynamic traffic assignment, transit and non-motorized modes. Then we'll talk about usability and speed improvement. And then we'll have a question and answer segment at the end. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, uh, please feel free to go ahead and enter them um, as you think of it in the questions box, and we'll try to get to as many as possible uh, during the Q&A. Uh, you'll be muted throughout the presentation, so uh, just feel free to uh, put your questions in that question box. Also, we'll be recording this, so a recording will be available after the fact. With that, we're going to dive right into our first topic, which is support for activity-based models. So before we get into the new features, I just want to take a quick minute just as a refresher in case you haven't used an ABM along with vZoom. Uh, and that's that vZoom is already a great plat platform for supporting activity-based models. It has a number of features already in there that really uh, help you build and use these types of models. First and foremost, it has a flexible and powerful scripting interface for integrating ABMs and, and various other things and for manipulating data. Zoom also has uh, 
included data structures for storing typical ABM data. These include population data, such as persons and households, activity types and locations, as well as information about travel, like trips, tours, schedules. Also, uh, all these are built into vZoom, and you can visualize them nicely. So if you look over on the right-hand side of your screen here, you can see I can visualize tours and see trip purposes, modes of transportation, travel times, things like this. Uh, all this is integrated in the vZoom data model as well, so it works really well with all the existing tools you may use, such as like link analysis with flow bundles, which makes it a really great tool for doing equity analysis and helps you leverage all that rich ABM data you have along with your travel demand model. Also, vZoom's general speed in handling things such as assignment skimming are very helpful. Many of these ABMs are quite large and are complex. So anytime we can shave off some run times by uh, making our software run faster, that's always a big help with these larger models. So again, these are all existing things that are in the in vZoom already. I just want to make a mention of them just so uh, to put in context with the rest of the, the system. Next thing I want to touch on really quickly is Activity Sim, since we're going to be discussing it today. So Activity Sim is becoming the leading ABM platform in the U.S. Many ABMs that are currently being developed or planned will be developed in Activity Sim. It's an open source consortium-led effort. So members of the consortium uh, join. They fund and direct the development effort. If you want to know more, you can visit Activity Sim's website, available by the link here. Uh, we're not affiliated with Activity Sim. They were involved in this project. I just want to give you a place to go to find some more information. If maybe you're not familiar with Activity Sim. So Activity Sim is primarily an ABM engine. So you apply it with the input it needs, uh, mostly in text files, and these come in the form of configuration files, CSV files for data and matrices. It's going to process them and provide you with output files. Again, in text format, typically things like CSV files. There's not much in the way of uh, graphical user interface or usability, and this is similar to a lot of other ABMs that are out there that have been used for a long time. And this is going to be challenging because it then takes quite a bit of effort to integrate these ABM engines with your travel demand modeling software. Uh, these, also, these input and output files tend to, tend to be really large, um, and oftentimes it's a big chore to store, manage, not to mention even like view, explore, and understand these data. So it really be a challenge. And this is an area where we feel like vZoom, due to some of those reasons we discussed and we're going to discuss today, um, is a really great fit to use along with side ActivitySim. And this is the reason that we developed an ActivitySim interface to work directly with vZoom. What this interface does, it allows you to store your ABM data, both as inputs and outputs directly in vZoom. We're able to pass data back and forth with ActivitySim as well as to run Activity Sim without the need to develop a, a script interface to do so. What I really like about this is this can be set up in such a way that once you, your model run is over, you've imported the results, you have all your input and output data for your ABM, plus your assignment results, all your past storage, all that in a single file, which is, makes passing data back and forth with colleagues, with clients really easy, but also allows you to explore and visualize all that data alongside each other and leads to a very streamlined process. So to dive a little bit more into detail uh, about how this works, uh, the interface really comes in the form of three new procedures. First is to export data to ActivitySim that exports all the input data that ActivitySim needs from vZoom. Then you run ActivitySim, and then you import those results back into vZoom. And on the screenshot on the right here, you can see uh, where those procedures are. Great thing about this is they're all configured uh, by the graphical user interface. So there's less messing around with like text configuration files. Um, if you download version 2023, there is a new example file. It's uh, demand activity sim, and that has a very small example file that shows you what this looks like. It doesn't include a distribution of activity sim. That's something if you want to actually run the run the model, you would need to download that as well, but it has all the input data, output data, all that kind of stuff on there. So feel free to download that and um, explore it. The interface also includes some additional functionality, such as the ability to do location to location skims. ABMs typically will have either one, two, or three, three zone systems. These consist of traditional zones or TAZs, microanalysis zones or MAZs, as well as transit stops. So you can have a combination of those. Now in vZoom, we store 
those MAZs or micro zones as locations. Now you have direct support for doing MAZ to MAZ or location to location skims, which is very important for things like walk and bike where you need that additional resolution, uh, as well as stop to stop skims for public transit. So this can has in the past sometimes been done with outside pieces of software, but now that's all available directly within Zoom. So it's one less thing you have to uh, integrate or, or manage separately. It's all kind of built into that software. And on the next screen here, um, give you just kind of an example of what those dialog boxes look like. This is the export that exports all the input data that activity sends need. And here you can see how the graphical user interface, you can set up how those skims are exported uh, for activity send to consume. So also note that you also have the ability to uh, run and import results from population sim as well as a part of this. Just as an additional piece too, uh, if you're not familiar, this past year we launched Zoom Publisher, which is a cloud-based visualization platform for travel demand model data. Basically allows you to directly export all your model data to the cloud for visualization that you can then share with teammates um, or clients. As part of this, we've also included a ABM trajectory visualization now is available. So you'll find that if you try the free trial, you'll be able to do that. Uh, it's available on our website. You can sign up for a 30-day trial of using Publisher, play around with it, um, and see what kind of cool visualizations you can make. With that, we're going to move on over to our next topic, which is dynamic traffic assignment. So Generally, when we're talking about dynamic traffic assignment in Vizoom, and particularly today, we're going to be talking about Vizoom simulation-based dynamic traffic assignment, or SBA. Uh, we've released a couple of pretty important and, and nice updates to SBA for this year, uh, as well as a few things that are kind of more along the lines of supporting functionality or things that are uh, workflow items that, that work well with the process. So the first one of those is, uh, we now have a lane-based SBA. Prior to version 2023, this was always link-based, so you weren't able to restrict certain classes of vehicles from certain lanes. Now that's possible, so you're able to designate, for example, things like HOV, chain, HOV lanes, do things like hard shoulder running, directional lanes, um, dedicated lanes for AVs, CVs, CAVs, uh, all these are uh, now possible. If you look at the video on the left or the right here, uh, you'll see that uh, on the leftmost lane, only blue vehicles because we've restricted the yellow vehicles from entering those lanes. So uh, this is a great new feature. In the past, it's been typically a little bit difficult to do some of these HOV lanes. So this makes the process much easier, much more streamlined. And this is just an example. This is an um, an actual graphic of how you designate this, but in 2023 you weren't able, or 2022 rather, you weren't able to designate individual lanes, uh, the TSIS for individual lanes. Now you are, and these can be things that can change over, over time as well. And then another example here, if we look at this uh, bottom roadway, initially this topmost lane here has no traffic on it, and over time you're going to start to see only the yellow vehicles start to utilize that. Just another example of, of how this lane-based SBA uh, would look like. The second big feature we've added is a hybrid macro meso assignment. So what this does is allows you to uh, do both a static assignment and a uh, simulation-based assignment within the same model one. So prior to this, you could choose to run your assignment as either SBA or as a static assignment. Uh, now this combines it. Um, this is great because when you're talking about dealing with these really large models, sometimes you don't necessarily need that high of a resolution over the entire model. This allows you to use SBA only in critical areas where you need that additional level of detail. Um, this also allows you to maintain the regional perspective though. So compared to maybe previously where you would have done a sub-area model rather than the whole model, you can still maintain the entire regional model, uh, maintain path choice across the entire model. It's great because now you don't necessarily have to go through the process of coding 
complete intersection details, like geometry, signal timing, things like that, if you don't need that level of detail in those areas. So another example would be maybe you're utilizing a regional travel demand model from a NPO, but you're working on a project with a city or county, and they're really only concerned about those level of detail in their particular jurisdiction, so they can code all the details into their network, simulate their network in SBA, use a static assignment for the rest, so they still get that regional context, but don't uh, have to sacrifice doing the detailed modeling they want to do in their own area. As a part of this as well, a new feature is now you can warm start SBA with a static assignment. This is possible with both a uh, hybrid or just a standard SBA. So basically, you can use a static assignment as an initial solution for SBA. Hopefully, something that again will save you a little bit of uh, time and modeling uh, as well. Now we move on to some of the features that work well alongside of. SBA, but also could be used for a number of other uh, in other a number of other contexts. For example, maybe if you're working with vSIM as well, if you want to do micro simulation. The first is going to be a network-wide signal optimization, and this is now available with RBC controllers as well. This was not wasn't previously possible. So now you can input all this controller data, run a network-wide optimization that you can then utilize during your SBA. Or, again, if you're doing uh, vSIM work, you may want to have all that information coded in this way and stored in vZoom and then exported out to vSIM for micro simulation later. Um, you have a variety of ways to kind of work. You can do offset and green time optimization, offset green time and cycle time. Um, you can use have weights for different paths, uh, as well as objective functions for wait time in the network number of queued vehicles. You really have a couple of different ways you can do this. Uh, so this really helps with these large regional DTA models. You really need a, a way to effectively time the system so you don't uh, end up with a really poorly functioning uh, traffic signal system in the simulation. You can see here, you know, a difference in the space-time diagram as um, after you, before and after you've done the network-wide optimization. The next piece is pseudo-dynamic volume. So this was a feature that was already in 2022, but it's been significantly improved for 2023. And this is part of the functionality that enables the hybrid assignment. In short, what pseudo-dynamic volumes does is breaks the result of a static assignment for a single time period out into multiple time periods. Now, this is available as a separate procedure, if you do it as part of a hybrid assignment, there's no need to specifically deal with this. It's just part of the process. But there are some other use cases where you may want to use this. Um, and if I start the animation here, um, what this will do is it will actually respect the travel times as well. The so trips that take place across multiple time periods, the volumes will be separated into the buckets for those individual time periods for the links they're traveling on during that time period. In much the same way that for a dynamic assignment, you would need to uh, define a demand time series, either using a percentages or weights or have multiple matrices uh, for the different time periods, you would need to do the same thing here. Um, so again, this is very powerful for using the hybrid assignment, but there's also a few other use cases where this may be interesting. Um, you can see here, uh, chart how it will break out the results of that static assignment into volumes per time period. In addition to SBA, um, new structure enables dynamic ODME. It also run dynamic flow bundles so you can have time restrictions for your select link analysis. You're also now able to export VSIM paths with dynamic volumes and you can also do sub Subnetwork generation with a demand time series. So these are all kind of things where can any kind of simulation be helpful. It also uh, can be useful for other interesting kind of like sketch planning things. If for reason you need to understand uh, how the flows change over time. And I do have one example of that, which is uh, population or 
of flows through a rail station. So uh, these are flows from a regular static assignment, um, but these were broken out for time periods. So you can see now, uh, step through the time periods and see how those people move through this, the station. So uh, quite, a, quite a few ways this could be really useful in your modeling. All right, with that, we're gonna transition over to our improvements for transit and non-motorized modes. So a lot of times with uh, transit agencies will have uh, fare card data. So they'll have check-in, check-out. In the case of something like the Mono Metro Rail, you, in the DC area, you, you tap your card when you enter the system and you tap it when you leave. So uh, we do have the capability to import all that data. Um, with that, we've introduced a couple of new plausibility checks that help match that up to the network. And it can be in the form of check and check out data where you don't necessarily see those transfers, um, or it can be check and check out per vehicle. Uh, so you can check, uh, maintain that th throughout the entire path of the vehicle. So uh, this was available before, but it's been significantly improved by breaking these out um, as much as 150 times faster. So uh, if you have that kind of public transportation data, it's really easy and a lot faster now to import that into Zoom for analysis. Uh, next is stop area assignment. So uh, many times if you're doing an assignment to the transit network, uh, if you do more of like a direct assignment, um, you would need to uh, generate separate zones for the individual transit stops, create connectors, convert your stop area matrix over to a zone matrix and then run the assignment. There's a new procedure for that that really consolidates that down. There's a generate zone for stop areas procedure. So if you're doing this type of transit analysis, there's a lot less kind of intermediate steps you have to go through because Zoom's gonna take care of a lot of that for you. Um, you know, then you can just run the assignment. So it's much easier if you have this transit data, fair car data overall between these two new functionalities to import it, run assignments, do analysis. Additionally, uh, we have some improvements to the GTFS importer. Uh, weekly calendars are now imported, as well as the shapes.txt file is now imported as intermediate points on the link. Uh, so you get a lot better kind of true shape with those GTFS importers. And along with this, there's a speed improvement to the GTFS importer as well. If you ever used the GTFS importer before, you may know the typical workflow is that you would import that GTFS file into a blank Zoom file, and then import that by the import PUT supply from Zoom into your other network. Uh, so that's been improved as well to correspond with the improvements to the GTFS importer. Those intermediate points flow through into your new Zoom network. Um, the routing has been improved, and once again, there's a speed improvement with that as well. We also have improvements to the OSM importer. So if you've used that before, you know that you have a drop down box where you can uh, decide what type of data you want to import. And there's a couple of kind of pre populated versions of that with varied levels of detail. So you can do a more coarse network if you're mainly concerned, concerned with like highway network all the way down to really detailed urban networks with things like uh, pedestrian links and, and things like that. We now have included a new version, which is the detailed urban bicycle network. So it's going to import all that bicycle route information from OSM, including things like the type of cycling facility, cycle track, uh, cycleway, um, all those various different kind of bicycle treatments that are available. It'll also uh, give you the surface type as that's available. So, so is it a dirt trail? Is it an asphalt? As well as import those uh, named cycle routes. So again, in like the DC area, we have the WOND trail that comes in, it's flagged that it's on as part of a named cycle route, as well as the name of the route is on there as well. So this really helps you get really detailed bicycle information uh, quickly through OSM. To go along with that, we've included an import of the elevation data that's available from OSM. This is useful for bicycle applications, but also many other applications that's now part of all the OSM imports. Uh, 
And if you're not aware too, Museum also has a dedicated bicycle assignment that's available. So this pairs really well with this new uh, DTL Urban Bicycle Network import for you to do various types of uh, bicycle applications very quickly using these two tools. And just to give you kind of an idea, this is a network of the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area or, or, or part of it here that was imported from OFM. Uh, gives you a really detailed uh, bicycle network, and this was combined with some publicly available bike share data to, to kind of run some assignments. So really the amount of effort required to get this really detailed network is pretty minimal. And then here is a isochrone that was basically shows you the accessibility of various parts of the area to any of those bike share stations. So uh, again, really quick to do kind of like accessibility studies or quick assignments using this uh, detailed importer. Next up, we are gonna move on to our graphics usability and speed improvements. We have a number of speed improvements uh, to talk about. Uh, probably first and most exciting is the uh, an up to 50% time savings in PRT skin calculations. Uh, so this is a, really an opportunity to save a lot of time. Again, as models get bigger and more complicated, we want to uh, save as much time as possible. So through a modernization of, of how these are, are stored and used, uh, the assignment paths, we're now able to speed that up really considerably up to 50%. You also see it's up to 70% in the incremental assignment and filtering of public transit, but also a more modest but nice improvement of 10% with uh, public transit assignments and skin calculation as well. So it's all just part of our continued uh, effort to keep things really up to date and as fast and efficient as possible. For graphic updates, the two big updates are going to be First, you can rotate the link bar labels. So you can do this either uh, globally or individually. Um, this means that links are, that are uh, oriented vertically can have your link bar labels displayed horizontally or whatever angle you would like. Globally, this is done by right-clicking on the links button in your network editor and selecting the bar labels set rotation angle. And that's where you can choose vertical, horizontal, or user-defined angle or along the bar. And here you can just see a quick how these were moved from being vertical to horizontal. If you want to do these for individual bar labels, you can right-click on right-click on them, and then you have the option to do that, and you can move them uh, vertical, horizontal, or you can actually drag it and rotate the bar around yourself. For the legend, you now have the ability to set the width individually for each of those legend items, uh, the, the horizontal width, and that just helps you maintain a nice compact legend. Um, text will wrap appropriately. And if I click over to the next slide here, I should be able to see an example of that. So you can see, see here how you can rotate individual bar labels. So both of these things just help you produce really nice looking uh, maps if you need to send these out. And this shows you how you can do it globally. And it's possible to uh, reset the rotation as well. Now for the legend, you can see here, you can just, within the legend, just interactively uh, drag that and keep your legend nice and small. Also, for the new version, the procedure sequence has been updated. So first you'll notice the graphical represent representation has changed, and that looks a little more like a traditional outline view that you may see in other places as well than it did previously. Uh, the change is not only graphical though, now groups can be nested to any depth. In this way, you can easily move or copy these groups around within the procedure sequence, and overall gives the procedure sequence a little more modern feel. Also, being able to nest it, to additional levels really helps you just better organize and maintain complicated procedure sequences uh, and just is an overall nice visual upgrade as well.
Next, we've introduced user-defined groups for user-defined attributes. Oftentimes in big models, you'll get a, you'll find that you end up with a lot of user-defined attributes for various network elements. And sometimes as that number gets larger and larger, it can be a little bit more difficult to organize and sort through all those attributes and understand what they're for. Now with these user-defined user groups, you can group them together based on the year, what the purpose is, maybe their calibration data, uh, collected data, uh, what their purpose is, any of those things that you see fit. This also allows you to add all the attributes from a particular group to your list views. When you pull up the attribute selection dialog, you now just select the group and uh, move it over. So it populates all those individual attributes into your list view. Now you can create or manage these user-defined groups by going to the list menu and selecting user-defined groups. You can add a user-defined attribute to a group in the dialog box when adding or editing those user-defined attributes. Um, when you're in that like add or edit user-defined attributes dialog too, it's possible to create a new group directly from there as well. And this is just one of those things that uh, just overall helps you keep your model better organized and easier to understand what all those attributes do. If you would like to use additional sources of any kind of background maps or imagery, uh, you now have the option to use WMS or WTS background maps. This was possible before, but the interface has been updated. Previously, you had to know the entire URL and, and what the format of that was. Now you only need the base URL for the service, and then the configuration can be done within the dialog box. Allows you to select various layers and styles, and then you also get this nice preview. So in this case, I have an example of an imagery service for Washington, D.C. Um, this one's pretty straightforward because it only has one layer, but there a lot of these services have a lot of different layers that you can select and, and change the styles, things like this. So it makes it a lot easier for you to configure these outside imagery services to work within VZoom. So there's been an update to the way uh, Python is installed along with VZoom. VZoom now installs its own Python installation under the VZoom directory and no longer installs it in the program files directory. Um, this just makes things a lot cleaner. Oftentimes, if you may have multiple different versions of Python or multiple different versions of VZoom or other software with Python installations, this just keeps everything nice and separated by having it within the uh, VZoom directory, has a bunch of the add-ins that are supported already installed, you're still free to use your own virtual environments or point to additional libraries from the user directory. Before we move on, there is just one other, uh, the newest service pack was released. Uh, I didn't get a chance to make some slides for it. One exciting new feature as well is an improvement to the UTDS uh, format importer. So if you're importing intersection geometry data or signal timing data from things like Synchro, maybe from APMS system like Centrax, things like that. The importer has been improved. You have a lot more options of what you can do. This is a shared interface between both Vistro and vZoom. But if you have a lot of intersection data and any of these kind of formats and ATMS, as well as things like count data as well, um, definitely something worth exploring uh, using that to get that data into your vZoom model. All right, with that, that concludes the What's New presentation. Uh, we're now gonna take some time to do questions and answers. So if you have any questions, please now enter them in the questions box and I'll try to go through as many of those as possible. Uh, one question related to the activity sim interface. Uh, I can't remember if I touched on this or not. Activity sim installation is not included in vZoom. It's still something you need to install uh, separately. We're, we're not providing that, so it's something to be downloaded from the activity sim website. Question regarding path retention in vZoom. Yes, path retention for your assignments is available. Uh, there's an option that can be checked within the procedure sequence. Uh, that allows you to, to procedure settings that allow you to toggle on or off path storage. 
all that gets stored within the resume uh, file. So um, it's stored pretty efficiently. And just to give you a little bit of idea as far as scale, um, I know one large ABM that had all the ABM data, so synthetic population data, tourist trips, it was, I think roughly 4 million people, maybe like 11 million trips, along with complete path storage, was like a little less than half a gig file, I think. So the the storage of all those paths and ABM data is very efficient within Zoom. The question about traffic timings, how can they be optimized? Um, there's a, there's a, quite a few different features for doing that. Um, there's method, I believe the objective function is for um, number of wait time, amount of wait time, queuing. Um, there is, I believe, some ways in there to do it with counts as well. So there's a pretty flexible system for doing those, those counts. Um, that is discussed a little more in depth in the what's new document. And uh, I believe there's an example file as well that shows you how to configure that. Can you download the Zoom outputs on an OSM network? Um, I guess, Chayton, what do you, oh, you just answered it on there. So you, you could export a shape file, um, but if you didn't run the assignment on the OSM network, um, you would have to do some some map matching to get that uh, put over top of the OSM network. Back to the traffic timings. Uh, are you gathering, how is the data being gathered for the traffic video detection? Um, so typically, you could do one of two ways. You can use uh, your assignment, whether that be the static assignment uh, for that period or the dynamic assignment to get traffic counts. Uh, but if you have video detection data that's available in that UTDF format, you would be able to import that with that new UTDF importer. So you will need to, uh, it's possible to import that and use the actual observed counts as well. And that's both in should be available in both Vistro and Vizu. The question came in if parts of this like activity sim integration uh, could be useful in helping to integrate with other activity-based models or similar systems. Um, I would think in some ways it probably would because you could use that, if nothing else, that activity sim export um, to help get you some of those export files you need, CSV files, uh, that whatever your ABM may, ABM may be would need. Um, so I, I can see some instances where you might be using some of features of that without necessarily using uh, directly activity sim. Uh, for the two signal timings, can it be sent directly to the controller? Uh, not at this time. Um, you wouldn't be able to directly send those. Is it possible to optimize signal split without changing cycle length in VZoom? In VZoom 2022, the procedure uh, doing this seems to change both signal split and cycle. Um, I believe that is improved in 2023. Chait, do you happen to know off the top of your head if, if that's possible? Yeah, on, actually, you can do that in VZoom 2022 as well. Uh, there is a selection on the signal controller menu over there where you can either do in the drop down 
uh, cycle length or only splits based on a given cycle length or none. So there are three options available and, and these continue to be present in Visum 2023 and as well. Okay, thanks, Jay. All right, I think we're starting to see the questions slow down a little bit. There may be one or two that I can um, maybe need a little bit more information or, or can answer uh, offline. Um, I did just see just one come in. Uh, previously, it was only possible with stage-based controllers do the network optimization. Um, now you can do RBC uh, as well. So that's another one of the improvements. Um, but yeah, with that, I think we're going to end the question and answer. Uh, my email address is adam.groves at ptvgroup.com. So if you have any questions, you know, please feel free to reach out. If, if there's anything I'm, I may have missed when going through these questions, uh, I'll try to get back to you within the next day or two. Um, but I think with that, we're going to go ahead and conclude today's session. I do appreciate everyone taking the time to join. Again, be on the lookout for that follow-up email that's going to have links to download the, the new version. Uh, you're also going to have the availability of the recording of this as well as to download the presentation. So uh, please stay little, uh, keep on the watch for that. And with that, thank you all so much for attending today, and I hope you have a great holiday season. All right. Thank you.